Hello, my name is Luke and welcome to this PyTorch tutorial series. In this video, we're finally looking at the attention mechanism. As per usual, all the code you see is available on my GitHub repo. If you're new to the channel, remember to subscribe to stay tuned for more. So what is attention? No doubt you've probably heard a lot about it in regards to transformers and large language models. But in this video, we're going to go right back to basics and look at sort of the fundamental ideas behind attention without actually implementing any specific you know, deep neural networks or transformer based models. We will see those eventually in the future, but in this video, I just wanted to focus on the attention mechanism itself, what it relates to and how we got here and how we can start to use it a little bit. We'll have a little bit of an example at the end, but not nothing into depth. So attention. But what attention allows us to do, or the idea behind what attention is allowing us to do, is it provides a mechanism to pull information directly in an explicit way from various sources. So to get a good idea or an intuition around what I mean by that, let's have a look at a very simple way of pulling information from, say, a tensor or a matrix, and that is index. So the first example here we have in the notebook is just indexing a data set. So firstly, what is our data set? Here I'm just using PyTorch's MNIST data set to just load a data set class. And then I'm just creating a random index. And then here I've got my loop list comprehension here, where I'm just iterating the get item function and randomly selecting basically 100 numbers and then I'm concatenating those into a tensor. And so this is gonna be my data set for a lot of the examples we're gonna see in this notebook. So if you're not familiar with MNIST or PyTorch data sets, I do have videos on that as well, but if you are, I've just pulled 100 random MNIST numbers from the training set. Okay, I've organized this as well, just to make it clear, as a 100 by 784. So the images are 28 by 28, so 784. So every row of my matrix of my 2D tensor is going to be one of the images, right? And if I wanted to index one of the images from this matrix, all I would do is index that first dimension. So here, let's just index dimension, uh, the first dimension as index zero. So that'll pull out the very first number, right? This four here. So very simple indexing. Uh, you've hopefully seen that before. So attention, as we're going to see, is a kind of way to allow our networks to do a sort of similar thing. But of course, the big problem with this is that, uh, you know, how are we going to train our model to do something like this? We can perform a similar indexing with matrix multiplications. You can backpropagate through direct indexing like this, but we want it to be a trainable way and neural networks, it's all about matrix multiplications. And so we can actually perform the same indexing with matrix multiplications if we set it up in the right way. So before we actually run this code, let's go over what we're going to do here. So let's have an even more basic example. Let's assume I've got my that data set tensor and it's going to have, you know, every row again is going to be some data, data object. For now, I'm just going to be really basic and this is going to be a 2d vector so every row is going to be a 2d vector a b c d e f so you can see in this case here we've got a three by two matrix and for now i'm going to call that my value so my data set is going to be my value normally how we'd index this as we saw we just put in the index of the first dimension here and we return everything for the other dimensions, which will be a 2D vector there. But what we can do is we can actually assign a unique vector to each of these rows. So if we assign a unique vector to each of these rows, then the easiest way to do that is with a one-hot coded vector. If you're not familiar with one-hot coded vector, it's basically a vector where we have all zeros and then a one in a single location. So either like that, or we could have a one here, something like that. 
a vector with all zeros except a one in one location. Now that easily allows us to have a completely unique vector per, um, per row, but it also means that all the vectors are orthogonal to each other. And we'll see why that's important in a second. So if I want a completely unique one, where they're all orthogonal and I've got three in my three data points in my data set, then I'll need a three by three, three by three matrix here. And it will look something like this. In this case, I'm just making an identity matrix here, the same shape as the number of rows in my value, my data set. And I'm gonna call this K for the keys. So every row of my keys matrix or my unique matrix here corresponds to a row of my values. Okay, now how do I index one of the rows of my values uh, if I want to select out one of those vectors, or those rows. What we need to do now is provide the index, or in this case, provide a query vector. So, where am I? Yeah. So what I need to do is I need to provide a query that uh, relates to the values through the keys. So all I have to do in this case with these one hot coded vectors is provide the key vector that corresponds to the row that I want to index. So if I want to index this first row here, I can just provide the same key. Um, and if I do the matrix multiplication, so again, this is a one by three. So if I multiply this out now, let's see what happens. So let me just do that here. So firstly, I've got this one zero zero. If I multiply this by the first column here in our matrix multiplication, we're going to get a one. And up's going to be one. The next one, it's going to be one times zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So it's going to be zero again. And finally, it's going to be zero again. So hopefully, as you already know, that's going to result in a one by three. And now let's multiply this result by the value matrix. Okay, so again, we're going to multiply this right here. That's going to result in a a, the rest are going to be multiplied by zero. Same here, it's going to result in B. And there we go. The result of this is going to be the row we wanted. A, B. And we can do the same with any of the rows. If I wanted the second row or the next row, I'd provide this key, the query, the next row, and that would result in CD in that case, so the D instead. Uh, same for the other ones, and you can make the vector, the key, as large as you want, and it will give you the same result. So all I've done here is use PyTorch again to implement the same thing. I've made the one hot coded query vector. We've put the one in whatever index we wanted. Again, our keys are going to be that identity matrix. I'm just going to comment this out for now to show you that. So I have 100 you know, data points in my data set, so it's going to be a length 100. If the index is zero, there's going to be a one in the very first index. And we can see that my keys is going to be an identity, sort of summarized it here, shortened it, but it's just going to be an identity matrix 100 by 100. And just to show you that it doesn't matter what order my keys and my values are. So it doesn't need to be a value. The um, keys doesn't need to be an identity. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna randomly shuffle again the keys uh, matrix. I also need to shuffle the values so that the key and value pairs stay in the same row. Uh, and in that case, you know, a keys matrix is gonna be randomly shuffled. I just wanted to show that it didn't need to actually be an identity matrix. It's not about the fact that it's an identity matrix. It's about having that unique um, and orthogonal uh, key for each entry in my keys matrix. The reason why being orthogonal is good is because we get this case where it's zero everywhere else except for when it exactly matches, in which case it's just one. So it returns the exact value, which is why I'm using the one hot coded vectors. Okay, but I'll do the same thing. 
Well, I should mention here that this is actually should be K transpose. Just missed that K transpose. In this case, the identity transposed is itself, so that's why it worked as well. But technically, this should be K transpose. So Q times K transposed, and then times V. Okay. So again, that's what I'm doing here. It matters now because um, it's not oh, it's not an identity matrix. So the query vector times a key vector gives us our index map. So this index map is just this thing here, what I'm calling the index map. And that should result in zeros everywhere and a one in the location corresponding to the row in our data set or our value tensor of the thing that we're trying to look up. So you can see here, because I've shuffled the keys and the values that index zero uh, query, which had the one in the one location has actually moved somewhere else. If I didn't randomly shuffle this and again, it's going to be in the first location. So it's managed to find it in uh, its new location. Where is it now? Now it's over there. So you can see this, we're building this mechanism of a way of, as it says here, to look up and find some value. So finally, we're going to take the index map and just multiply it by the data set tensor, and we should get the same value out again, that four. So we can change this to something else, maybe 10. We got a three, and we get the three again, even though we've randomly shuffled our, key, our keys and our values. So as I mentioned, what we've done here is a kind of lookup through matrix multiplication, and that is what attention kind of is. It's kind of like a, a lookup where we can provide whoop, some data set. And with that data set, we have some description called the keys. And if we want to find something in that data set, we provide a query and that query compares itself to all of the keys, finds the key that it close, closely matches. And then from that takes the corresponding value. Now, in this case, we had these orthogonal one hot coded vectors, but if we were trying to incorporate this into our neural network, well, how are we going to get a one hot coded vector? When we want to incorporate this into our neural network, the query keys and values are all going to be the outputs of a neural network. And as we know from outputs of our neural networks, those are continuous values. Um, in general, you know, negative infinity to infinity, continuous values, they're not nice discrete vectors or matrices like we have here. So we need to somehow work that into our attention mechanism or this lookup that we've just seen. So I like to call attention a sort of soft version of this lookup. What does that mean? It means we don't have these discrete ones and zeros everywhere because you know, that's not what we get from our neural networks. You could, you know, randomly sample or uh, quantize maybe even. Um, but if we were randomly sampling, we can't really back propagate through that. Um, so, you know, if you have a categorical distribution, you randomly sample from that or sample ones, we can't back propagate through that. So we need some way to make sure that our lookup mechanism uh, can be back propagated through. So it's differentiable uh, and we've already got matrix multiplications. So, all we're going to do is basically ignore the fact that we might not have perfect ones and zeros, but we need to do a few extra things as well. So before, again, we look at the code, let's just have a look at what we're going to do now. Um, actually, now we can jump straight into the code. So instead of one hot coded vectors, I'm just going to use some randomly sampled vectors. I'm just going to randomly sample from a normal distribution for my query. And again, I'm going to have a key for every value in my value tensor or my data set tensor. Uh, but the values are still going to be that same data set tensor as before. So as before, the length of our query vector was the number of um, you know, data points in my data set tensor. We wanted unique ones. We wanted them all to be orthogonal. So we needed 100. And also our keys was 100 by 100 again because again, we needed 100 unique uh, vectors. But now we're gonna say it doesn't need to be exactly the same. So we're not going to potentially get a unique vector for every single key and every single query. 
and we're going to see the result of that and see that it maybe doesn't matter that much. Uh, let's start this off as a vector size smaller than the total number of data points in our data set. The process is exactly the same, it's just that our keys and our vectors are now randomly sampled from a normal distribution. Okay, um, so we multiply our random query by our keys transpose, and we get now what we're going to call the attention map. So we had index map, we're going to call this attention map now because it's not going to be a one hot coded vector, it's going to be some uh, you know, vector that's going to be continuous values. So, uh, yep. But the problem with having that not be a one hot coded vector, where if we were to multiply this by our value tensor and get a nice unique value, uh, you know, a, a single little row, is that if we were to let this vector be whatever values you want, then the result was going to be some it's a random combination sort of of the values and it can be a very different result to any of the values actually in our dataset tensor. So to try and tame this a bit and get a nicer result, what we do is we force this vector to uh, be all positive values that sum up to one. So as a result, what we're basically gonna get by multiplying that attention map by the values is a weighted sum, a weighted sum where all the weights are positive values. So or the weighted average, I guess you could call it, of the values, right? So if one particular row is more important, it's going to get a higher uh, value in this attention map. If it's not as important, it's going to be closer to zero. And so the result now from this soft lookup is going to be like a weighted sum. So again, going back to sort of our file lookup example, if say our keys were the file names and our values were the file contents, then our query might be us looking up some file name. And if the file doesn't match exactly, um, we might get a sort of ranking of how close our file name is to existing file names. Um, and whereas before we were assuming that we're only gonna take the one if it matches exactly, or take the file where it matches exactly, we can imagine that this sort of soft lookup is going to give us a single result, which is the weighted average of all the files based on how close that file name is to our query file name, right? So if you were doing file lookup, that's probably not what you wanted, but in the case of our neural networks, that's, we're gonna see that that is quite useful or is good enough for what we're trying to do. Again, making sure that it is a differentiable process. But ensure that that vector does sum up to one and it's all positive values. We're going to use a soft max. So we're just going to soft max over that vector uh, and over the last dimension. But in this case, it's just a single vector, so it doesn't matter too much. And then we're going to take that attention map and multiply that by the data set tensor, same as before. So what we can see here is we can look at that attention map and see that the larger soft max value in this case is actually quite large. So we can have a look at that. So most of the values are actually quite small, as you can see, e to the negative 11, 6. The largest one is actually quite close to 1. What that means is that in this case, for the randomly sampled ones, uh, there was one uh, random key that actually really, really closely matched our query. And so we had a much larger value because we're doing basically a dot product. And so the softmax uh, reweighted that and we have a value very close to one. So there was one kind of unique vector that really closely matched the query in our keys. And so as a result, what we're gonna see by doing that weighted sum is a result that very closely just looks like whatever value was in that particular row for that corresponding key. Now, if we sample this again, you can see in this case, less close a match, and we're starting to get sort of a combination of multiple values Again, this one very closely matched. Also, let's so it's trying to find one that's very low. Now they're all pretty high. Let's drop this even further low. So there we go. So you can see that as I drop the size of the vectors, that means there's less chance of having a lot of orthogonal vectors, which means that many of the uh, keys are gonna be quite similar, which means that the query is gonna match more keys or be closer to most keys. And then when we do the softmax, it kind of averages out. The softmax is only going to be very high if it's very uniquely 
matches only one, the query only very uniquely matches one of the keys. So as we have smaller vector size, uh, there's less of a chance that the query is going to uniquely match only one key. And so we're going to get a smaller, largest softmax. And as a result, you know, we're going to get more sort of blended components. If I were to bump this right up to 512, say, we're going to pretty much almost always get a very uh, a value very close to one for the larger softmax and again attend to almost only one of the values in my data set. See occasionally though we do get a mix. Okay so importantly again the softmax is differentiable all the matrix multiplications here is differentiable and so we can uh, use this as sort of a mechanism within our neural network. So note here that at this stage at least this process that we're going through there's no learnable parameters yet there will be learnable parameters when we incorporate this into our neural network but that's why this is called a sort of a softmax mechanism it's similar to a convolution sure we're going to have learnable parameters here but we're more focusing on the sort of process that we're going through here the way we're multiplying and softmaxing um yeah so a couple of examples here as well we can actually have multiple queries so here we just had a single query but we can have multiple queries go back to our example here if we were to simply change my query vector here and just add another query let's just say that's now one zero zero and made this a two by three the result of this process is basically just going to return both the second and the first uh, entry in my value in the order in which it appears in the queries. So this is now going to be C, D, A, B. Like that. So we can perform multiple queries and that will result in um, a tensor that again just indexes multiple locations at the same time. Again, it's independent though. So independently indexes multiplications. So here I've got a small vector size and we're going to do eight queries. Again, I'm just going to randomly sample eight query vectors and also randomly sample all the keys, one key per entry in my data set matrix. And we can have a look at the result. So you can see some of the results of some of the queries resulted in probably a softmax very close to one and others less so. Keep doing that. Put our results there. So the output again is going to be eight by 784 similar to our example here where each row again is just going to be the result of a different query so we can do multiple queries in parallel so we can also do multiple attentions in parallel so the difference being that here in this single instance of attention we have a set of keys and values if we were to perform attention again, it might be on a different set of keys and values. So it's like we're doing a lookup on different sets of data. So a single instance of attention will be doing query on one set of data and then multiple queries, sorry, multiple queries is just multiple queries on that same data set, but multiple instances or multiple heads as we call it is doing queries, potentially multiple queries, multiple queries on multiple different data sets. So we're not just querying the same data set, we're querying multiple data sets. Or we could just have multiple instances of querying the same data set with different heads. Um, don't worry about the, the nuances there too much. Um, the main thing is that the keys, and usually the values, though in this example here, I'm keeping the values the same, it's the same data set, but the keys and the values usually are going to be different per different instance. Where again, the query we did here, multiple queries, we were multiply, we were querying the same keys and values multiple times. Here we're going to be querying different keys and values. So again, the values in my example here are going to be the same. The keys though will be different. Just that's the important distinction to make. So to do that, we're going to use batched matrix multiplication uh, instead, but everything else is going to be the same. We're going to basically treat the number of heads as a batch dimension. So number of heads, number of queries, 
But for every instance, every head of the attention, we're going to have a different set of queries um, and a different set of keys. So let me just run this. Okay. So let's have a look firstly at the attention map here. So the attention map we can see is a four by eight by 100. So four is the number of heads and then eight is the number of queries. So we have, we kind of skipped over this in the previous example. We have four instances of attention and every instance does eight queries. And so every query is gonna result in an attention map size 100. So we have four, eight, four by eight, uh, attention map size 100. And we can just have a look at one of those. Go every single one of those attention maps should sum up to one independently. We're soft maxing over the final uh, dimension there. And then the output here is going to be similarly four by eight by 784, which is the value dimension or the size of each data point. So four instances of attention. Every instance has eight queries and it's going to result in, you know, a single data point. If we have a look now at the result of that. Here I've organized it as every row here is a different instance of attention. So a different head of attention and then the columns are the result of the queries. Again, every query is different for every head. How this might normally be returned is that we would concatenate all the different heads and return uh, sort of heads as a single instance. So um, we'll, we'll see that in a moment as we look at PyTorch's implementation of multi-headed attention. So uh, we've had a look at the sort of mechanism of attention and attention as a soft lookup. But now how do we actually incorporate this into our neural network? Again, adding some learnable parameters as well. Uh, and we're going to use PyTorch's multi-headed attention as a way to explore that. So the exact mechanism is identical to what we've seen before, uh, but we do have a few learnable parameters in order for our model to learn to produce keys, queries, and values that are relevant. Again, we're not going to go too much into an implementation, how you actually incorporate this into a neural network, because that's highly specific to the actual task. But let's have a look at what PyTorch's multi-headed attention does here. So again, multi-headed attention as we've seen. So again, we have multiple heads, queries, keys, and values. You can see that uh, PyTorch returns the result of every head and it concatenates them together. As I said, return the concatenated uh, output of each head. And it also multiplies that by some our learnable parameter some weights here so it concatenates and then multiplies it by a weight parameter so it basically passes it through a linear layer to produce the actual output you can see here the output of each head so each head is just attention um, and the input queries keys and values are multiplied by some weight parameters so you can see the queries keys and values in this case are all the same Thing, but for each head, what it's going to do to produce the unique queries, keys, and values for every head, it's going to multiply by a different sort of linear layer to produce the queries, keys, and values for that particular head, and then perform that independently, concatenates all the heads, and then sort of combines them with this final linear layer. Okay. So let's have a look at that now. So again, my vector size is going to be 32. I define the number of heads and also a batch size as well, because we can perform this over a batch um, where, you know, every, every instance in the batch is going to have the same attention layer performed. One thing to point out as well is that, where are we? Here we go. For the number of heads, um, what it's going to effectively do is actually split the input queries, keys, and values uh, up into each of the heads. So one of the first things we need to define is, again, the vector size of our queries, keys, and values tensor. 
we can either define that as a single size, like I've done here, 32, but you can also independently define the dimension of the keys and the values if they're going to be different from the shape or the size of the query, uh, query vector. Um, so we define the size of our query vector, and what this is actually going to do is it's going to split that into multiple heads. So whereas before here, I didn't split it, I just created multiple or four vectors of size 32. What PyTorch is going to do here is it's going to split whatever embedding size I provide, if it was 32, into four chunks, right? So eight in that case. So just to make sure that it's equivalent to what I was doing before, I've defined that embedding vector size as the number of heads times the vector size, so that when it splits it, each head is going to still get a vector size of 32. So that's just why I've done that. So I also need to define the number of heads, as we saw before, and batch first. Um, I won't go into too much as to what this is doing, but it's just to make sure that PyTorch is aware that it's going to be provided the queries, keys, and values as batch size, number of queries, um, or number of keys, and then however, uh, whatever size the uh, query vector is. So batch first. By default, it is batch first false. Um, and we'll see why that's relevant in future videos when we actually try to implement this into something. Okay, so once we've defined that, we need to provide our queries, keys, and values. Um, I'll run that, have a look at the results. So as we can see, the output of our forward pass for the multi-headed attention gives us two things. It gives us the attention output, so this here, but it also gives us the actual uh, attention map. So this attention map here, which is nice and it can be useful. Um, note here that we've got this parameter average attention weights as false. So if I uh, set that as true, which it is by default, what it's going to do is it's actually going to um, average the attention map over the number of heads. So it's going to, you know, we've got the attention map for each head and it's actually going to average over that. Um, so I set it to false so we can see that our softmax attention map is 8 by 1 by 100. Okay. That's true. You can see it's just going to be 32 by 1. It's averaged out that head's dimension. So again, just something to be aware of there. I've also only got one query here, which is why it's a 32, which is the batch dimension. Heads and then queries 1. All right, we can also make that query do whatever we want. Okay, four queries here that case. Again, to note that the attention output is going to be the number of queries by the size of the embedding vector in this case. It's going to be uh, 256 because again, it's vector size times number of heads. By torches, multi-headed attention will split that up and then recombine at the end. So just be aware of that. So to reiterate, we've got the input query key and values. They are going to be split up into each head. And then each one of those queries, keys, and values in each instance, each head, is going to be multiplied by a weight matrix to produce the sort of real query keys and values for that particular head because they're all the same at the start. So unique ones per head. Attention is going to be performed. It's going to concatenate the result of every head, and that's going to multiply by a weight matrix, and that weight matrix will be uh, produce an output the same as the embedding dims. So actually concatenating all these heads is going to also produce a, a matrix or a vector the same size as the embedding dim. And so this is just going to be embedding dim by embedding dim, right? To produce the same thing. So that's why in this case here, we've got 256. You can, um, uh, and here we had 32. So you can imagine it as we've concatenated the heads from the output here. Just want to make that clear. Uh, and the projection. So this is the in projection weights as well. Um, this is just the matrix. Sorry, yes. Because the queries, keys, and values for this particular multi-headed attention, I've said that they're all exactly the same shape. 
uh, because I did not define KDIM or VDIM, it doesn't actually split this up into like three different matrices. It actually just concatenates them and just multiplies it by a single one, which is equivalent, but it's just why this in projection matrix is seven, six, eight by 256. So this is just 256 by three. Uh, so it concatenates into a single matrix. If you were to define KDIM and VDIM, you're going to have projection for K, projection for V, projection uh, for query. So PyTorch's multi-handed attention actually does quite a lot. If you look at the actual implementation, there's quite a lot behind the scenes in order to try and make things more efficient because it's actually more efficient to do this in one multiplication rather than trying to do it in three sequentially. So just concatenate them, do a single uh, matrix multiplication and then split them as necessary. So there's quite a bit behind the scenes to make it more efficient. I'm just pointing that out here so you're not caught up by it. Okay, so finally, we're gonna try and train a little multi-headed attention. The task is a bit contrived, so it's a bit of a, not a real task. Uh, but what we're gonna do is we're going to provide our model with an example image, um, as well as a sort of data set. And that data set is that, that 100 images we've seen before, but I'm gonna try and pull an image not from that data set, provide it to our model. I want my model to kind of do a lookup and try and find, or, or rank rather, the images in its little data set uh, in order of how similar they are to my query image. And I need to hack this a little bit, um, so it's not exactly how you might want to use attention to get this to work, but it does, does work in the end. So here I've got a little MLP at the start, and that MLP is just going to be uh, providing a little bit more model capacity to encode the images. So I have my image here, which is my query image, and then the values. The values is going to be that fixed data set of 100 images, and we're just going to pass both of those through that MLP. So we're going to encode all the images in the same way. Um, so if you remember back to the sequential as well, linear layers and the layer norm can handle a batch of a sequence of images, which is effectively what our um, data set is, we're going to concatenate. So we're going to expand the values tensor to make it a batch size by number of examples so that it fits. But again, it's going to be a 3D tensor, but the linear layers can handle that and it will just act as though it's a batch of a batch of vectors. Um, yes, so that produces our images and our values. Now, for our multi-headed attention, you can see here that I'm providing the query image as the queries, but the input for the uh, keys and values are the same. So it comes from that dataset tensor. Now that's okay because again, there's gonna be that linear layer for the queries and the values to produce the actual vectors that then go into the attention mechanism. So even though these are the same here, the actual query, so the actual keys and values used in attention are gonna be not the same. They're gonna be different because that linear layer is there. Then we get our output. I'm not actually going to use that output um, because these values are not the actual, say, pixel value. So I want to do a pixel comparison to how, um, how similar they are. And so what I do is I'm actually just going to use the uh, attention map, that attention map, and directly do a weighted sum of the actual images in the data set that pixel values to produce the output, right? So this, because we have it going through linear layers in and linear layers out, kind of more doing the match of a sort of representation space rather than the actual pixel space. And uh, you could do a weighted sum in representation space where each of the things you're summing up aren't actually very close to the output you want. But in pixel space, they're gonna have to be. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll explain what I mean quickly. So let's say um, the closest image in pixel space to what I wanted was here. But what I can do is I can say that I can combine the sort of these three vectors in the representation space to produce, you know, scaled correctly to produce this representation, which can then be decoded into the image. But if I were to actually look up what these correspond to in image space, they actually look quite different from this vector, right? So by doing it in pixel space, it kind of forces the actual images to look similar, not the actual representation. 
if that doesn't make sense, don't worry too much. Um, but I just want to compare values in the actual pixel space. So the actual embedding dimension here that this produces is not going to be the same size as the pixel space. So we're going to sort of squeeze do attention in the lower dimensional space. And then we're going to use the attention map, which is going to be, you know, 100, uh, 100 dimensional vector to actually compare or to, to do a weighted sum in the actual pixel space. But here I'm still using the day training training loader. So there is a chance that the image that we have or are querying with does exactly match one of the images, but that's going to be okay. So how we do this is number of examples. So that's just defining, I don't think we actually end up using that in this case, but hundred images, I don't think I use that, whatever. Embedding dimension. So that's just what we're going to squeeze down our input images with the MLP. Also the Key, um, query key and value vectors that the multi-headed attention is going to use and we're just going to do one head here because I don't need it in this case. So I create my model, create my optimizer as before. Um, the values tensor as I said I need to expand that over the batch so I unsqueeze, add an extra dimension, expand over the batch kind of duplicating that same matrix multiple times so I can do this in a batched stochastic gradient descent way. So here I've got my batch of query images. So this is my uh, training data loader. Got my data. I reshape that. I flatten it out. Basically, I leave uh, an extra dimension here, which is sort of the number of queries dimension, which we need to provide. Again, if we look at the shape of our queries, they need to be N, L, E. L here is the number of queries uh, for our purpose. It's the length of the target sequence, but we're not going to worry about sequences for now. Just the number of queries. That's just one, uh, and that's our query. And then the values is going to be the same thing every time. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that weighted sum of the pixels and compare it to the query and try and reduce that loss. And as a result, what we're going to get is this soft max attention map is going to sort of point to the actual images in my data set that closely match the query image. Again, we're trying to find the image in my fixed data set that closely matches my query image. So this can take a little bit of time to train. All right, so I've finished training now and we can have a look at our results. You can see the loss drops a little bit, but not too much. Kind of what we'd expect. We're not gonna get something that matches exactly because we're just doing a sum in pixel space. Uh, but we can do an example here where we take some random query image and get the output and have a look at what that looks like. So here is that query image that we've selected. So I've just defined some index here. And what I'm doing here is I'm taking the output weights from my model. So here's the output image, which is the result of the sum. Here's that softmax weights. So if I just print that out, you can see I've got a batch of 64. And for each one of those, we are just, um, we've got a single 100 uh, soft max attention map. So if I just index that, you can see this is my attention map. It's some um, up to one. So I'm just here indexing one of the instances in the batch. And then what we're going to do is we're going to arg sort that. We're going to sort that from highest to lowest, so descending. And then I'm going to take the top 10. So we're going to take the top 10 of the indexes, indices of the closest. Uh, determined by the attention map. So we're going to take the index of the top 10 highest softmax outputs from the attention map. And those are going to be my sort of closest to the query image, right? Because those are the ones that contribute the most at the largest softmax value. They're going to contribute the most to the sum. Um, and I'm going to call that just my top 10 data. So here's my query image. And as a result from uh, these top 10, these are my top 10, again, from highest to lowest, so closest to least close. So you can see, yep, the closest images are all sort of twos, and then there's sort of threes and twos, and a bit more numbers as well. So one of the issues with comparing in pixel space, again, is if it's a sort of one that's maybe shifted off centered, there might be a one that looks exactly the same, but it's just not sort of centered in the same way. And even though those ones might look the same, they're not exactly in the same pixel location. So 
they might actually be very different or they might have a very low score in that attention map. So again, there's probably a better way to do this in representation space, but here I've just done it in pixel space. If we actually look at the softmax weights, you can see that you just see those first three actually contribute the most and actually all the other ones don't contribute very much at all. So it's mostly those first three images that the network is using to construct that weighted sum. Um, and we can actually have a look at the result of that weighted sum. So you can see again, uh, it's not actually that good doing the weighted sum in pixel space as we, we'd expect. But for our two, the first one here kind of matches it by just doing that weighted sum of those first three. Pick a different one. Again, so this five actually, it's chosen as the top match. That might be because kind of does look like a five. The top of the three is a bit weird. And the scoop here, the lower bit, maybe matches this a bit better. And then we've got some more threes. You see that first one likes that the most. And then the rest. Well, I pick another one and find one that hasn't matched very well at all. Uh, you can see this one has, has used a lot more of the other images. Look, which one was not very good. No, they're all okay. Yeah, one more. Six. Again, it's found something that matches very close. And again, it's using mostly the top three images there. Okay, so this is just one way you could use something like attention in order to do a lookup here. We're doing a lookup in terms of the similarity in pixel space between our query and some fixed data set. Um, only one head here because we've only got one sort of query and one data set that we want to look in. Um, you could do multi-head with the same query, in which case you've got the same query and you're looking at multiple different data sets for the closest match, like that. Um, but here, I've just tried to keep it simple. Okay, so I haven't really covered how we're gonna actually implement this in our neural networks and some of the tasks you may be familiar with, NLPs or image space as well. I just wanted to talk about the actual mechanism itself and what it's all about. Uh, in future videos, we're gonna now implement this in different, uh, different tasks. Uh, seeing firstly how we can implement it in our sequential LSTM models to improve those and then uh, in future in a future section see how we can actually just use attention for sequential modeling create what is now known as a transformer model so like I said if you haven't subscribed already make sure you do that to stay tuned for future videos that's all for this video and I'll see you in the next one